Good morning and good afternoon to all of you for joining our live webinar today, Transporters in Drug Screening and Toxicity Testing. Today's webinar marks the fourth of five upcoming talks that will make up a part of the 2021 Research Insights Transporter Webinar Series. My name is Jason Villa Gomez, Marketing Manager at Nania Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's event. But before we get started, my colleague, Dr. Maria Barthmas, Senior Scientist and Product Manager of the Surfer team, would like to say a few words. Um, a warm welcome also from my side and on behalf of my team colleagues, Andrea and Cecilia. Um, Jason already mentioned that this is the third webinar of our Transporter Webinar Series. Maybe some of you attended the previous webinars already, but for those who didn't, uh, if you're interested, you can find all the recordings on our web page and watch them on demand. The first three webinars had a very academic and scientific focus, and so will the fifth. But today is a bit different, um, as we wanted to focus on SSM-based electrophysiology applications in pharma and CRO work. So we invited Thomas and Roberta to tell us how they use the Surfer 96 in drug development processes. I'm looking forward to that. So I also want to take this opportunity to thank the speakers, Roberta and Thomas. It's really great having you here today. And in general, this webinar series um, was only possible because so many scientists agreed to speak here about their research projects. We really appreciate that a lot. Uh, thank you very much for that. We are also happy about the high number of participants over the course of this series. Thanks also for attending. It's really great that people are interested in this. We encourage you to, to ask your questions to bring this event a bit to life. Um, Jason will tell you later how you can ask your questions and thanks for tuning in. So with that, I hand back to Jason. Thanks, Maria, for the exciting updates uh, to look forward to. And like she mentioned, we have a couple of the on-demand uh, webinar series that you could access on our website. Joining us as presenters today, uh, Thomas Licher uh, from Sanofi, specifically Frankfurt. There he's head of integrated drug discovery. Uh, he'll be presenting SSM-based technology for transporter modulating compounds, a case study and Roberta Benedetto from AssayWorks, where she's a scientist. She'll be presenting surfer-based assays for mitochondrial toxicity screening and intestinal transporter-mediated drug delivery. Uh, but before we get started, a couple of uh, points of due diligence regarding audio and, and questioning. Uh, so by default, you should be connected through uh, Zoom automatically. You can listen through your computer headset. You can dial in remotely uh, via mobile, tablet, um, and as Maria mentioned, the Q&A session uh, will be addressed at the end of both presentations. So if you could just submit your questions throughout the course of the presentation, um, you'll find um, the chat window on the right-hand side of the screen. With that, I'll now hand over to Thomas for the start of the presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh... And also thanks a lot, Maria, for, um, for organizing this talk. And also thanks a lot to the Nanion team. Uh, by the way, when I start my presentation, I realized one of the next speakers is Matthias Quick. So we were at uh, 25 years ago at the same university. So that's pretty interesting. So, and I hope you can see my slides now. Uh, just go into the screen share mode. Okay, just a second, should already be there, but Zoom in the last two days is sometimes not doing what it should do. I will try again. So, can you see it now? Perfect, now just go into the Yeah, full yeah. screen and then duplication of the screens, just Thanks. a second. Exactly. Okay. I hope you can see it now. Perfect, we can see your presentation and hear you. Very good. So I'm Thomas Licher, I'm head of integrated drug discovery in Sanofi Frankfurt. So um, I'm biologist, biologist by training, I'm doing a lot of biophysics in my career and I worked a lot of 
ja, Iron Channels and Transporter Projects at Sanofi. And one of the projects um, I want to present today and in detail our essay development for a SM, SSM-based uh, essay for direct measuring the transporter activity. And we did that on the Surfer 96 machine. First of all, I want to show you um, the target uh, we were interested in. The target is SSC6A19 or BORAT1. This is uh, the protein name. It's an apical sodium neut neutral amino acid supporter of polarized uh, absorptive epithelia and expressed primarily in the kidney and in the small intestine. And it should mediate up to 90% of the free neutral amino acid reuptake or uptake in the gut, for example. Why we are, for, as a Sanofi perspective, we're interested in this target. Um, there were two indications that this uh, transporter is relevant in two diseases. Um, one rare disease, it's called urea cycle disorders. And what we want to target here is we want to inhibit SAC6A19 and the, you reduce the substrate uh, for the urea cycle in this uh, really severely ill per patients. And the second uh, relevant indication was diabetes because a couple of years ago, um, there was a publication that elevated the plasma levels of amino acids could be a driver of diabetes development. And also, as you know, um, they are hard, the so-called HARDNAP patients, which is a, a, gain, a loss of function mutation in the SSC6A19 gene. They have reduced amino acids levels in special diets, and they normally say show not really a strong phenotype um, that they have really not this uh, transporter present. And therefore, it was really of interest for us to have a target here to, um, yeah, to treat these uh, diseases with not a lot of side effects. We want to modulate the transporter with a small molecule and want to inhibit the uh, transport activity. Um, up to now, the pharmacological tools uh, were at that time uh, close to zero. There were some publications of some tool compounds. I want to show you later. We measured these tool compounds on the surfer and I can show you the results in the next couple of slides. Nevertheless, um, normally we progress uh, a, um, a project for a drug discovery um, development with, a, yeah, with, with different essays, with high throughput essays, with low throughput essays, primary, secondary, tertiary validation essays, orthogonal essays, autologs, and so on and so forth. So what, what I want to show you in this slide is a screening tree for this project. We started this project with a membrane depolarization assay and we screened 1 million compounds. And afterwards we checked uh, um, the positives in an orthogonal rapid fire MS based assay and we measured the uh, leucine uptake in cells. But nevertheless, both assays are not direct and are prone to artifacts, modulation of membrane um, polarization and so on and so forth. So that's the reason why we really strive for a direct assay where we can measure the transport activity without any issues on cell content, uh, cell regulation and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why we've selected the surfer technology to develop an assay for SSC6A19 to validate our uh, promising hits. Nevertheless, in the screening tree and all familiar with drug discovery, you know that we have a lot of also uh, selectivity assays. We um, developed a set of four transporter assays in this regard to measure, for example, interference with uh, sodium transport or sodium binding sites and something like that. And of course, we are doing a lot of uh, selectivity and um, essays to check if the compounds of interest are blocking or binding to yeah, a lot of targets and then they are not so of interest. But nevertheless, the goal in this start study was really to develop a direct electrophysiological assay to validate the SLC transporters, uh, transport modulators. A brief uh, or a couple of words for the surfer technology. I hope you are familiar with this technology and you can see on the right, this is a surfer 96 SE in our lab. 
It's really an, a very nice machine based on the Felix platform from Cybio with the uh, surfer um, instrument incorporated in this pipetting robot. It, it's pretty stable, works pretty well. And nevertheless, we really like the machine to direct record transporter protein activity. You need no labels and no radioactivity, which is also clearly a plus of this technology in the transporter field. It's called a cell-free electrophysiological method. What, that does it, what does it mean? Of course, we need cell cells for these uh, technology, but nevertheless, you uh, use just cell membranes and not completely intact cells. So that's the reason why the currents are very very um, discreet and only normally when you when you uh, choose your activation protocol very well only derives from the transport of interest. Also, what we've uh, seen in the past is the membrane preparations are stable for months. Um, the longest period we checked the membrane pre preparations are now, I think, 26 months, so more than two years, and they work um, as uh, we prepared them yesterday. The surfer machine is validated for a couple of membrane sources. And you see here the green um, mark we checked already in-house. So we measured uh, native tissue, mammalian cells. SSC6A19, of course, is done with mammalian cells. Organelles, we, we measure a lot mitochondria in the past, and more and more we are also working with proteoliposomes for uh, specific transporter projects and also, for example, intracellular transporter projects. Now I want to give you on the next slide a brief essay overview. So the essay steps, normally we prepare um, at the beginning, the sensor plate, which is a gold sensor, and we added or we add the solid supported membranes and attached our target membranes of interest afterwards. In this case, it's membranes prepared out of a CHO SAC 6A19 TMEM or Collectrine uh, 27 cells. During this process, you measure the conductance and capacitance of uh, the SSM to assess the quality. And then, of course, you apply the uh, defined buffers via the automated uh, perfusion system of the robot. In this example, we use as assay buffer a pretty simple uh, buffer with a lot of sodium, a tiny little bit of calcium and magnesium at pH 7.4. Our activation buffer is uh, the same buffer plus an, plus an amount of leucine. And as you can see already here on the right, this is a current from our lab from SSC 6 and 19. And these are really nice currents, but I want to go more into detail on the next slide. Um, the most important uh, step, and I, in my opinion, this is one of the most important slides in my presentation, is how to build um, a complete assay protocol with a surfer. As you know, you can um, apply multiple activations. And for us, what you see here on the bottom is, is a protocol we used at the end in this, um, in this project to measure uh, current inhibition. But now I want to go step, step by step uh, through the development of the assay protocol. So first of all, you try to optimize the single activation step which is composition of buffer, how you add the activation buffer, what's the speed of your addition and so on and so forth, how, you, how long you want to, um, to, me to um, measure the currents. This is the first step. And afterwards you check the recovery. So this is how you uh, really uh, can recover so your sensors which you can do with normal non-activating non buffer, length of buffer application, and so on and so forth. And afterwards, uh, you measure the baseline stability. This means that you measure several activation steps without substrate. This is what you can see here on the left. So normally, this is just baseline addition of, of uh, a buffer without leucine and you see no activation and it's pretty flat and this is how this should look like. Sometimes you see tiny little bit of, uh, of, of, of currents or whatever there and then you, you need to optimize your protocol anymore or even more. Afterwards you measure the activation stability and you check 
how often you can recover your sensor and you see more or less the same currents afterwards without a lot of rundown. Rundown for specific preparations could be an issue. So this is really important to measure a lot of activations and see how your currents evolve after your recovery steps. And in this regard, we have now here what you can see in the middle. Um, you, we have we measured three times and I put the laser point on three activation steps. And in this regard, you see more or less no current rundown, which is pretty good. And we tried this with up to 25 activation steps. And afterwards, of course, because you want to measure the inhibition of the current with compounds, uh, you need to optimize the um, compound incubation step and how long you want to incubate um, until you see a decent decrease in currents and so on and so forth. And then at the end, of course, you need, um, you, you check how you want to measure the compounds. And this is what we done on the right. So this is the normal activation protocol, but here already a compound was applied and you see that the current is more or less 50% reduced. So after, um, yeah, after this uh, assay development or protocol development, let's phrase it that way, this was the result at the end um, with the standard activation protocol we use for compound measurements. And the results I want to show you on this slide. So here you can see in the middle, uh, the a normal uh, current answer after application of sodium and loisine. And this is, is a current in red. With uh, no loisine, you have a baseline, a flat line, you see more or less nothing with um, out uh, sodium, but with, with loisine, you see a tiny little bit of currents, but this is uh, neglectable small compared to your normal uh, current response. We, of course, uh, checked the same with wild type membranes. And as you can see here, with sodium and loisine or without loisine, you see no effect in wild type CHO membranes. Also, what is pretty nice when you apply uh, D loisine or L loisine, you see no currents with D loisine or pretty small currents. You only see currents with L loisine, which should be the case because uh, the L loisine is the substrate which is transported and D loisine is normally not, not well transported. We also um, developed um, an autolog assay with mouse because as you know, the first animal model is in, in mice and that's the reason why you want to see also effects on the mouse. Um, transporter and the mouse currents. And this is here on the right. And you see also nice currents, which are somewhat smaller compared to the human uh, isoform in this regard. Um, and a little bit, the kinetic is different, but you also see nice and reproducible currents with the mouse transporter. What you also should do when you develop this kind of assays, so you need to check how many proteins I need to apply to each sensor and how many is, um, substrates you need. And in, we did that, and I want to show you on this slide, different amounts of protein, which are on the left. And um, this is yeah, not really standard, but pretty often we are between 10 and 20 microgram per sensor, which we apply to, a, to, to, the, to the sensor and we see the highest currents with this amount of protein. Also, um, as you know, SAC6A19 is sodium dependent. We, we checked uh, different sodium concentrations and as expected, the, uh, with higher sodium concentrations, you have higher currents at the end. And the maximum or the, the best results are between 100 and 120 millimolar uh, sodium. So, and afterwards, of course, you want to also measure the substrate dependency of the amino acid substrate. Normally we use loisine in this regard as, um, as transport agent. And as you can see here, we measured the KM for human on the left, for mouse in the middle. The KM is uh, roughly around 1.5 millimolar. And this is more or less comparable to literature data, which you can see on the right with uh, different uh, assay technologies, for example, fluorescence-based membrane potential and radioactive uptake assays or two electron voltage clamp. 
They are more or less comparable. The SSM-based uh, data are a little bit higher compared to the other techniques. Um, this could be the reason of uh, the assay setup and that we are only working with membranes and not with um, intact cells. But nevertheless, it's pretty well comparable to this liter to the literature data. Um, to really validate the transport assays, we applied all amino acids um, which are available and which are important, of course, because we want to check uh, uh, in comparison to a, a paper where the radioactive assay was, um, was described, we want to check the amino assay substrate dependency. And more or less what you can see here on the left, and this is of course the case, uh, ampular and neutral amino acids are preferred for SSC6A19, and this is comparable to the literature data. But on the right, I also want to show you some, um, some results, and this is pretty interesting. With loisine, you've already seen the currents, and on the left is the uh, SSC6A19 membranes, on the right are the white type membranes. And what you can see, uh, clearly see, loisine is a very good substrate. Glutamine is also a substrate because you see, less, you see only small currents in wild type and you can inhibit the currents. Glutamic acid is uh, no, not a substrate, it's something else. This is an artifact or whatever of this measurement because you see the same current-like structure in wild type cells. And the same is true for arginine, where more or less also the um, direction of the currents seems to change. This is, of course, not the case because uh, this is not real currents because they are, could not be inhibited. And on the, in the parental cell line, they are completely identical. So this is pretty important to check every time your substrate with wild type membranes to really clarify if you have a decent current or not. And if you have a tool compound, this is even better to validate your uh, response. Now this bring me, brings me to the tool compounds we tested. So in literature, nimosolid and benztropine are described. And everybody who's, who's familiar with the field knows this, these compounds are inhibiting not just this transport or ion channel, it's also doing something else. And this is what we can see clearly see here with the um, with the with, with the surfer assay, benztropine is doing nothing in the surfer currents, no inhibition at all, up to 100 or 300 micromoles. And nimesulid is more or less also problematic because you cannot reach a plateau of inhibition until nimesulid uh, clocks into your assay buffer. So this is also really a problem. This you can calculate an IC50, but I would be careful with that. So we checked in-house uh, compounds, and this is a compound derived from one, more, one of our first screens, is LB4895. It has a, a IC50 on the human transporter, roughly around 12 to 14 micromolar. It's pretty re reproducible, and we uh, choose this compound as um, tool compound for all our assay validations, also for the rapid fire assay and also for the fluorescence-based assay. Interestingly, um, the mouse transporter, the inhibition is right shifted. So it's a weaker potency on the mouse transporter, which is pretty often the case for compounds inhibiting SAC6A19. On the next slide, so this is also very interesting. So we checked um, the compound, uh, the current inhibition with in increasing incubation time and with the increased amount of substrate. And this is, of course, perhaps a little bit as expected or also give, give you some hints about the binding site or the mode of action of this compound. Clearly, the inhibition increases over time, which is what you can see here from the left to the right. So if you increase uh, the incubation time, the inhibition is, is really um, more or less doubling from 15 minutes to 13 minutes. And also when you apply more substrate, for example, from one millimolar to three millimolar loisine, you clearly see a decrease of inhibition, which gives you the hint that, that the compound could bind in the area of the binding site for loisine. Of course, this is something you need to check with uh, structural biology, but this is the first hint that this could be the case. Now, um, as somebody who is really 
keen for good quality, for reproducible data, we are doing a lot of statistics. And this is what we've done also for the, for the um, surfer assay. We measure a lot of plates and these plates are measured on different days in uh, a period of six months. And then we compare the plates, we calculate the SP factor, we calculate the success rate and the inhibition and so on and so forth. And this gives, gives us a hint that this assay is reproducible and that you, for example, can profile compounds for years and the, um, the data you get are still reliable. And as you can see here on the left, so what's pretty interesting, the low control is pretty stable. You see normally not really a current with a low control. Low, low control means um, no addition of lysine. If you add lysine, the high control is somewhat variable, but this is normal because this is clearly dependent from, the, from your um, membrane preparation and the quality of the membrane preparation and this could vary from day to day but nevertheless that's not so a big deal but because the SB is far above 10 which is pretty good for this kind of assay and so you have really um, a good signal window. And more important is this is in the middle. So we apply a concentration of 50% of the compound. And this is of course in the upstroke of the IC50. And if the data are really very, very reproducible, the inhibition data for 50% inhibition, they give you a hint that the assay is really robust. And this is the case for the, for the surfer assay. When you apply, here in 10 plates, 50% um, inhibition concentration of LB4895, uh, you see an inhibition between 40 and 40, 40 and 50%. And this is really, really stable. So this is very good. And also the success rate for each plate is um, very often above 90%. There are some outliers, but they are, the longer the, um, the project phase was, the less the outliers in plate will be. And normally at the end, we achieve success rates far above 90%. And also what is pretty interesting on the right, this is the same compound and it's called compound X because this, this is one of our lead compounds. Um, and these two IC50s are measured um, within a time period of one year. So we measure the IC51 with uh, 0.35 micromolar um, at the beginning. And then one year later, we checked if we still see the same results and that's the case with, diff which, with, uh, with a different membrane preparation. And this is really a robust assay. And this was really, really amazing at that time. Then of course we uh, checked um, our compounds we derived from the, from the screening cascade to validate them. And here I want to show you as examples, we measured a lot more compounds, but this is what I, what, what I can show you currently. These are compounds from four series. And on the left, you see the IC50s from the, L, uh, from the MS assay. And on the right, you see the IC50s from the surfer assay for the human and the mouse autolog of SSC6A19. And um, we can very well uh, validate uh, three of the four compound series uh, with also a decent activity in the surfer assay. Um, one, of the comp one of the series, and this is pretty nice, was devalidated, and this was uh, one of the compounds before we have this uh, assay which uh, were put into an animal model and which was not active, but was active in all other assays, but the surfer assay clearly shows that this compound was not active to, on the human autolog. It was somewhat active on mouse, but this is, by the way, something we could not explain currently. On the right, you see an overview um, of, the, of, of the correlation of the surfer IC50 with the IC50 from the mass spec. And normally the IC50 on the surfer are threefold um, uh, less potent compared to MS due to whatever reason, but it's a different assay setup. But nevertheless, the surfer assay could validate the compounds. And what is really important for us to devalidate uh, a couple of specific compounds, we then stopped immediately. 
This brings me to the summary of my talk. I hope I, I could have shown you that the surfer essay for SLC 6 and 19 is really well suited for profiling purpose. We clearly see sodium and leucine dependent currents and the measurement of the current inhibition is robust and reproducible. We have high SN and success rates. And of course, this is, was highly automated in, in our hands. Um, we measure up to six, uh, eight plates a day in, in the highest turnover times. And this was, was very well to validate our compounds. Nevertheless, also, as I mentioned, we can devalidate compounds and this is even more important for us because otherwise this is waste of resource. And so the surfer assay is well suited to in the screening cascade for SSC 6 a 19 and also could help to, uh, to, to show you really that you have real inhibitors of the currents. On the next slide, I also want to show you and do a brief, uh, really brief advertisement of the Resolute Consortium. The Resolute Consortium is a, is a European funded consortium for research on solute carriers. We are also involved in that because we are the folk there who um, measure um, transporter, transporters with the surfer technology also in this consortium. And we already developed uh, essays for SAC 6 a 14 another um, amino acid transporter, and you also see here nice currents, for GLUT9, a glucose transporter, and for SLC 1A1 or EAAT3. And we have still 20 essays to go, which are on the list for the next two years, and I hope we can develop the one or the other essay also for this consortium. Thanks a lot for your, uh, for your participation. Thanks, Thomas, for the presentation. Um, now I'll ask Roberta, maybe you could transition to your screen share. Uh, once again, you can just keep adding your questions into the chat window, and we'll address them for both Thomas and Roberta at the conclusion of Roberta's presentation. Um, yes, so I'm going to share my screen now. Perfect. I just Thank have, you. I couldn't um, unmute myself after I shared the screen. <laughs> Yeah, took over control. Okay. So now you should be able to see my screen. Perfect. Yep. I'm going to go on mute now. Thank you. All right. So um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. And thank you for attending this session. And also thank you, and Ion, for organizing it and give me the opportunity to present the Say Works and uh, the work that we do on the Surfer 96 and our um, capabilities. Um, so the, um, I am Roberta, I am a scientist at Assay Technology here at Assay Works, and the talk I will give today focuses on the um, Surfer 96 SE and the technology behind it and how the Surfer fits in our in the landscape of drug discovery according to, to our point of view. So just to walk you a little bit through the um, to the talk, I will introduce Assay Works services, discovery services, and give a very brief introduction on SSM-based electrophysiology, since we already heard all the details from Thomas. And then I will introduce um, two case studies in which we use the surfer, one to assess mitochondrial compound toxicity or mitochondrial to induced compound toxicity and um, a screening, a small screening that we perform to identify uh, prodrugs or peptidomimetic compounds via PEPT1. Um, then I will give you a little insight on our assay strategy to um, reach a high, uh, to have a good quality in terms of concentration response data by not and not compromising on the data quality when using SSM electrophysiology. And at the end, I will um, uh, yeah just give a little overview on how the Surfer 96 fits in our portfolio and which kind of services can we we can provide. Um, so Assay Works is a CRO specializing on um, high throughput screening, and what we do is to perform um, in vitro bioactive assays. So we uh, quantify molec molecules, bioactive molecules, or chemical entities, and measure their bioavailability with uh, for um, pharma industry, the biotech, and sometimes for the university. And we are located in Regensburg, Germany. 
So um, how we do that is to either develop um, the novel assays for our clients or to adapt and expand protocols that are given to us from our clients and scale them for high throughput screening. Uh, we also perform then heat character characterizations in terms of um, toxicity, uh, concentration responses, mechanism of action investigations, and, um, and so on. Um, so I will just head jump into the SSM-based electrophysiology, but as I said, I will just give a small um, background because you already heard um, from the presentation before. So the SSM-based electrophysiology was basically developed to investigate all those targets that have a um, that are difficult with the conventional patch clamp, either because they have a very low turnover rate or because they are um, difficult, uh, so not, not easy to access. So, for example, they are located on any intracellular organelles membrane. Um, so, the difference between SSM and conventional electrophysiology is that this is a cell free system, so, no living cells are required. Uh, what you need, as you, as you now know, um, are membranes. So these membranes can really come from every basically, every, basically every source. Could be cell line overexpressing your transporter, could be native tissue, could be mammalian, could be insect, could be artificial. Um, a, a protein reconstituted into liposomes, for example, and then absorbed onto the SSM. So the SSM itself is uh, this um, layer, this lipid layer on top of the thiolated gold layer on which the, the membranes are absorbed. Once the membranes are absorbed on the SSM, these form um, capacitively um, coupled membrane compound. So when charges move through the membranes, because the transporter is mirroring the activity of the transporter, the membrane itself will charge and this will transfer to the by coupling to the sensor to our gold sensor and what you're going to see is on the right side you see the gray line so the experiment is based on um, a fast exchange between non-activating and activating solution where the non-activating contains everything for the transporter to be functional, um, except, of course, its substrate. And the activating solution, of course, it's the substrate. So you can see the baseline is uh, the non-activating solution would be this gray line that you see here. And once the um, activating solution is uh, provided to the transporter, then you see this on signal and then the off signal that mirrors the um, discharge of the membranes and then it uh, recovers to the baseline. Um, so when you think about high throughput screening, what we usually look at are surrogate assays, so which are typical luminescent or fluorescent, and they provide a phenotypic assay in terms of um, is my compound active on my target, yes or not, and how much is active. Um, but if you want then to look for more concentration responses, have, have a more physiological readout, and get insight into the mechanism of action, then um, SSM for us is uh, the better choice. Also in terms of if you want to then characterize further your lead and perform structure activity relationship campaign, then um, the Surfer 96 is what we um, use. So Nanayon um, developed two instruments, the Surfer N1 and the Surfer 96 SE. And I will be talking as Thomas about the Surfer 96 SE that has a as the name says, um, uh, 96, the possibility to measure in parallel 96 wells. So the first case studies that I want to show to you is this, um, um, we, we measured compound toxicity through the interference with the mitochondrial respiratory chain. So in this case, we isolated freshly from, from, a, from a pig heart um, in the mitochondrial membrane. So this is fresh, freshly isolated on native tissue. And then we performed electrical measurements of um, some of the uh, respiratory chain complexes, in particular the 2, 3, 4, and the ATPA synthase. So what you see here in the first slide, starting from the left, you have uh, complex two and three, succinate, oxidate, fumarate, and then there, um, the electron are passed from complex two to complex um, two via the cytochrome, uh, cytochrome Q to the complex three. This oxidizes the cytochrome C, and this is actually 
um, what we measure is then the trans this, this leads to the transport of four protons through the membranes, and this is our signal. So the charges which are moving through the signals is what we what the surfer will read. This is this, um, the electrogenic event. Uh, here you can see the original tracings in which you have the baseline, the, uh, which is basically uh, just the buffer with the non-activating buffer with succinate. Then when you provide um, cytochrome C that can get oxidated, then you see um, as a reflect of the protons leaving the, the membranes and you have a negative deflection and this is the sensitive, the corresponding corresponding uh, sensitive uh, signal than in the presence of uh, an inhibitor-like antimycin. And here it's then summarized as a um, um, dot plot, as a scatter plot, to give you an idea of the homogeneity of the signal. Um, when you look at complex four, here you have cytochrome C oxidation produces two molecules of water and two protons are leaving the membrane. So once again, you can see in the middle um, panel of the slide, the baseline in gray, the sensitive, the, the, um, the cytochrome C induced movement of protons in this case, and the sensitive sodium oxide current. And here is once again summarized in terms of bar chart. Um, so for the complex five, the ADP induced transport of protons via the TPAs, you should keep in mind that once you are measuring, in this case, the inner mitochondrial membranes, there are of course also other transporters that are on the inner mitochondrial membrane, such as the NT transporter. When you provide ATP, which is in our case here, the, um, the stimulus, when you provide ADP to, um, to the inner mitochondrial membrane that contains A and T, what happens is uh, the signal driven by A, A, A and T is predominant. So we use BKA to preload the sensor with BKA, which is a um, known inhibitor of A and T. So the experiments are performed in the presence of this inhibitor to exclude the A and T transport. And once protons are moved through, um, ATPase, once ADP is, um, is, um, is produced, then you see this um, positive uh, signal, which is then summarized on the last part of the slide, and the corrective um, oligomycin sensitive current. So what did we learn during uh, when we did this assay was that um, comparison to uh, traditional assays that, as I mentioned, are radiometric, spectrophotometric, or based on fluorescence, um, they provide very nice phenotypical analysis that gives a little bit of an indirect readout of the uh, mitochondrial protein function, because maybe other pathways can also interfere. And what we like about SSM electrophysiology is that this reduces a lot the complexity of your system. So there will be uh, basically no interference of other pathways in your measurement. It's of course label free and there are no enhancer required. And as uh, you know now, it's automated and of course has a higher throughput than conventional assays that are used to um, assess mitochondrial toxicity. Um, the second study of today was a small screening that we performed to uh, look for products and peptidomimetic compounds um, via PEPT1. So um, PEPT1 is a, a proton coupled importer for D and 3 peptides located on epithelial cells in the small intestine and proximal kidney tubule. Uh, why it was important for us to offer to, 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 to have this kind of, um, of, of screening possible on the surfer is because PEPT1 has uh, pharmacological significance. It's involved, implied into the uh, bioavailability of a uh, um, series of drugs and prodrugs that otherwise wouldn't be um, up taken, taken up from the epithelial cells. For example, a series of, of antibiotics like the lactamics or um, antiviral nucleoside prodrugs. So what happened is when the drugs reaches the epithelial is coupled to an amino acid or a D3 peptide, and then is taken up together with a proton. So this is what will give us uh, the readout on the surfer. And once it's transported on the other side of the membrane, then the uh, esterases will hydrolyze this amino acid, the drug complex, and the amino acid is then degraded and the drug can act on its target. In this case, um, the assay-ready membranes are prepared from CHO cells heavily expressing, overexpressing human PEPT1. So in this case, it's a, um, it's a cell line where, that we use to prepare our membranes and the substrate that we use is glycine glycine. 
Um, we performed the screening on our own bioactive collection of transporter ion channel set. We have a variety of um, molecules which are involved in a very different uh, scenarios, but for this study we focused on the transporter and ion channel, so we screened around 230 compounds. And here is just an overview of the assay conditions. As I said, we try to mimic the conditions of the um, that enables the best functioning of the transporter. So we have um, potassium chloride, a slightly acidic pH, hippus, and then in the control buffer, glycine that we fast exchange with glycyl glycyl, which is the preferred substrate for PEPT1. So in this slide, I just want to show you that the membranes, as you saw already from the previous talk, are really, if they're done in the nice, in the correct way, then they're very um, nice, stable. And here you can see 96 parallel measurement. And upon uh, repetitive addiction of the substrate, the signal is, there is no rundown of the signal and it's quite stable and robust. Um, from the uptake transporter assay, so I want to show you, we did this screening and now I want to show you just a few examples of what, of a few prodrugs that we found being transported by PEPT1 in which um, for each you can always find the baseline and then the blue graph that corresponds to our substrate, so to glycyl glycyl, and then in purple you can see the transport of the prodrug, which of course the signal that you see is not the prodrug itself, is the protons which is transported together with the prodrugs. Um, so what we learned when we were doing this um, screening was that when you want to do this kind of, um, uh, when you want to apply SSM or in general any uh, measurement, but at the same time you don't want to compromise on your data quality because you're doing a drug discovery campaign, for example, then um, compounds characterization needs high quality concentration response data. So you have to get a little bit uh, creative on how you achieve that. And this is what we did. So we um, usually what happens is that so each SSM sensor can support multiple measurements. Uh, but in practice, the number of measurements that you can perform are, of course, limited before one well receives too much, for example, and then there is a drop out. So typically, when you do um, concentration responses, there are two main ways. Either they are done in the same well, and this could be insufficient data point, or they're done cross well. And this could be an economical uh, investment, could be prohibitive. So we uh, developed a hybrid pipetin scheme that we call IX concentration response, in which we combine a relative, relatively a low um, amount of wells for a relatively high uh, concentration responses data point. So um, what, what you do when you do typical cross well concentration series, here you see eight panels. Each panel correspond to one well. Each well um, will start at the same point. So if you focus on this, it's uh, B stands for baseline. So they all start at the same point. Then each well receives two subsequent applications of the activating solutions. And then uh, each well will, re will um, receive one concentration. C1 is the highest concentration and then C2, C3, 4 up to the 8, which is the lowest concentration. And then we usually perform some washout to test for uh, washability of the compounds and recovery of the activation. So what happened here in this case is that you have one point for each well for a total of eight concentration points. And with the IX well concentration series for, this, for having nine um, in this case, you have nine points and you use only three wells. So you have, uh, we have here three um, plates. Each plate contain three different uh, set of uh, concentrations. So the high concentration and then three of them. The middle concentration also three um, scale down and then the lowest concentration. And each well will receive the three highest concentration. The second well will receive the three middle concentration and the third well will receive the three lowest concentration. So in this case, each well will have an in-well dose response of three plus a cross response of three more. So in this case, we will have then a total of 12 points. Um, I want just to show you how this perform in terms of uh, crosswell and IX well. They perform uh, quite similar, and what you maximize is basically the amount of compounds that you can screen per compound. 
compound plates. So with a normal cross well with egg concentration step, you can maximum measure 12 compounds per sensor plate, but with this IX well, uh, you can go up to 32 compounds per sensor plate, which is a quite fairly high throughput. Um, so at the end of this, I, I, I hope that you are kind of convinced that uh, the surfer has uh, quite a lot of benefits. It's a physiological readout of your essays, a slabble free um, targets, which are difficult to assess, are now easy to access, and addresses also throughput concerns with the 96 parallel measurement. This, of course, comes with um, challenges in terms of data interpretations. You have to wrap your head a little bit around it. There is a learning curve, and of course, cost of investment um, and ownership also of the of the surfer. So um, we at Assayworks offer this as um, a fee for surf service for a fee. So if uh, do it yourself is not an option, then you could consider about outsourcing it to us and our support starts from the tissue fractionation and membrane preparation through compound characterization and also um, structure activity relationship campaign and uh, using also our own uh, biomolecule library set and our sample management system. And with this, I would like to thank you for staying with us this afternoon and thank you for your attention, of course, and Nyan for giving us the opportunity again. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And if you want to contact us, you can do this at this email that you find here. Thanks very much for your attention again. Thanks, Roberta, for your presentation. Always a very good pleasure to hear from you and what you guys are doing at AssayWorks. Um, I'll go ahead and moderate some of the questions that we received now. So I'll start with uh, Thomas. Uh, first question that we received for you, what makes the surfer assay a direct assay for you? Wouldn't labeling the substrates be more direct? Okay, so um, why is this a direct assay? So it's a, you see after substrate uh, and co-substrate addition only the currents from your, um, from your transporter. And if you inhibit the currents, you can see, really see that you inhibit direct uh, currents derived by the transporter. This is for me the direct, so I, I did a lot with electrophysiology. This is the directest, di most direct essay you can get for transporters and ion channels in, in this regard. And we use, of course, not a uh, regular patch clamp because they, normally the currents on regular patch clamp for transporters are so tiny that this is not really robust enough to measure compounds. But um, you see really um, substrates more or less transported via your transporter and you see the currents derived from the, um, let's end it from the charge of your substrate. So this is really the most direct thing you can could be. Uh, fluorescence fluorescent substrates normally have the problem that they are transported not at the same way compared to your normal substrates. They are larger, they, the inhibition is, is pretty often slower. And for a lot of transporters also, you cannot even don't have a fluorescence uh, coupled substrate. And um, also there, the fluorescence, uh, when you have a membrane potential um, uh, sensitive transporter. You also have the issue that also, if you modify with compounds, the mo membrane potential, for example, which is not the case in the surfer, you cannot modify the membrane potential because it's not really there. For um, substrates, when you measure the fluorescence intensity in, in the cell and you have modifications of the membrane potential, the transport can be completely different in addition to the modified transport of your substrate because it's not the natural substrate at all. So for me, uh, not label substrate and a direct charge transfer is for me the most direct essay you can get. And then another question for you, Thomas, do you have an explanation or a hypothesis why you're able to devalidate compounds with the server, with the surfer? Any idea why they were false positives in the other assays? Um, this we don't have a, a clear explanation for that. So nevertheless, um, the different, if this, for example, is a compound and, I, and which modifies substrate, uh, uh, which modified membrane potential, for example, and we know SAC6A 
uh, 19 is also membrane potential dependent. So if you have a modification of the membrane potential, you will see an inhibition of the transport. And also the, the membrane potential assay, of course, it's membrane potential sensitive and you see effects there. And the same is true for the rapid fire assay because it's incubated with the with uh, compounds for, for a decent long time. And if you modify the membrane potential, you would also see an effect in the transport rate, which should, it is not a, a direct inhibition of the transport activity. It's an indirect inhibition of uh, secondary uh, effects of the compounds. Then one question maybe for, for both of you to elaborate on. Uh, could you explain in more detail how the surfer setup detects the currents? Um. Should, should I answer or? Yeah, you, you can start. <laughs> I can start. Okay. So as I as I mentioned, so the surfer is a surface electrogenic event reader. So what it measures is not directly we infer the current, but what it measures is the transport of charges. It's based on the fact that the membrane um, where the transporter is located, the transport as the transporter moves charges through the membrane, the membrane gets charged and increases membrane potential, and this is reflected on the sensor. Though, so the sensor thinks, oh, okay, there are charges coming in or leaving, and this is mirrored then into the direction of the signal, so either on or off. And from this, we infer the current based on the amount of charges which are moving yeah. then through the membranes, but it's not a direct measurement of the current. That's correct. And that's also the reason why this system is saturated at a specific point. So um, when your, your capacitor is saturated, then you see, don't see any currents anymore. And that's the reason why the currents are declining, which has nothing to do that the transport is not taking place, but the reservoir is full. You cannot me measure any charge transfer anymore. Then you have really to recover the sensor and then you can measure again. As I, as I have described in the uh, protocol development. And uh, one question for you, Roberta. Um, what is your experience with membrane preparations from organelles, in particular mitochondria? Is this very tricky or require special equipment? Um, so with mitochondria, um, so I have generated inner mitochondrial membranes from the pig heart, so from fresh tissue and also ah. from insect cells. Um, it's not that tricky. I mean, it requires a little bit of time. I would say one day in total, because there is an overnight uh, ultra centrifugation step, in which you have to, yeah, that you have to use if you want to get the inner mitochondrial membranes. And then there is a one step in which you separate the outer mitochondrial membranes and the inner mitochondrial membranes. So in total, it's about a day of work. Um, Overall, it's not uh, difficult. It's not a really challenging um, process, and uh, the yield of the membrane preparation is really is quite high. Usually, we have uh, so from fifty milligram from fifty grams of tissue, we can prepare around uh, two hundred uh, aliquots of one milligram per mL. So it's really then something that you can use in principle for 200 chips because you're going to use one aliquot per, per chip then. And uh, the signal is also, in my experience, the signal when of the membrane, which is prepared from a native tissue or the same prepared, for example, on uh, insect cells, um, on a cell line, not from a native tissue. Um, in my experience, it's a bit more stable when it comes from a cell line or more homogeneous, I would say, not maybe more stable. Stab stability is uh, comparable. Yeah, we, we also did this preparation of mitochondria membranes from Picard and we were also successful. One more question for you, Thomas, that I see here. Uh, is it possible to investigate reversibility of the inhibitors by washing them out? Yes, of course. So this is what we already did and perhaps this can also reflect to the quest, additional question in the chat on K-on, K-off kinetics, because this is also pretty difficult to measure, but what you can really do, you can apply washing steps at the end and we try to do up to 20 washing steps after our compound in, in, uh, in inhibition or incubation step. And you see, can see how fast your, uh, you can wash out your compounds and your far, how fast your currents recover. 
And then you can really judge, okay, this um, is a compound which dissolves much faster from the, your target of interest or slower. And I would not say yet you can really measure K on K off pretty directly, but you can, you can judge and you can discriminate and then you can try in your um, later assays in the screening tree, if there's a difference on the mode of action or in, if, of in your activity in, in more advanced assays like Transvel, Transport and something like that. And you see differences. I know this. Thanks for uh, finding the question in the, in the chat, Thomas. That was the first question that came in actually during your talk. Uh, didn't want it to be distraction uh, for you during your presentation. One final question that I see for Roberta here. Uh, for your special crosswell in well workflow, do you normalize? And if so, yes, how? Uh, we do a one point normalization. So each well has its own control basically. And then we normalize each well independently with a one point normalization. And then, um, yeah, we assemble the dose response together. Perfect. So it's a one point normalization. Perfect. Um, Maria, would you like to say any closing words? Uh, maybe we should announce uh, the fifth se uh, webinar series that we have upcoming. Um, which I'm sharing now on the screen, uh, session five. Um, for my part, just want to thank Roberta and Thomas for the great presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was really great. Um, yeah, no, nothing to add. It's just um, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. And yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks a lot also for organizing. Perfect. Thank you. Then we wish everyone a good rest of their day and we look forward to your attendance in session five, uh, which is uh, on Thursday, November the 4th. Thank you.